This time on Pedalbox, we're going back in time a couple of weeks to when myself, Adrian and my brother pulled this mangy looking little piece of rubbish out of the Rover and put in a shiny new big copper fin radiator. Now, as you saw in our last episode covering the SD1 here, the bodywork is now mint and it correctly keeps water outside of the car as it should. Unfortunately, the rest of the car, not quite so great at keeping fluids where they're supposed to be. Every vital fluid, I think apart from brake fluid, falls out of it somewhere. And right now, the biggest problem we've got is coolant leaking out of the radiator. We've also got transmission fluid leaking out the transmission and engine oil leaking out of, I think, the rear crank seal, which is great and nice and easy to get to. So that'll be a, a fun afternoon project one day. I'm lying, that's gonna be horrible. Um, but the nice easy one that we can do fairly quickly is the radiator, which is good because it's also the worst leak. Um, it tends to go through a full tank of coolant, a tank, you know, a full load of coolant every like, I don't know, sort of eight hours or so of driving, which isn't great. Um, especially if we need to, you know, sort of run it across the country to bail my brother out, for example, which is happening in a few days. So rush job, sort the radiator out and make sure it can keep at least one of its important fluids where it's supposed to be. So right now we're leaking from two places. We've got a very small leak around the thermostat housing, which is gonna be just a new gasket, so it's gonna be nice and boring. And it's leaking from the end tank on the old radiator. So the solution is this big new radiator that you saw me talk about at Christmas. I picked this up late last year and the reason I've got this, despite it being a manual cooler, um, a manual radiator and not super great for my application, is because it's actually about 150 quid cheaper than a new one, or a remanufactured one rather. SD1 radiators thankfully are still in production in the aftermarket, but not in really big volume, so they're still super expensive. And this one was a much cheaper route for me, even though I figured I'd still have to sort out an oil cooler for it. Well, here we are once again underneath the bonnet of the SD1. And you can see on the inside here, there's a nice big spatter of nice rusty coolant where the thermostat housing has been leaking. And from over this side, you can actually see quite a lot of, uh, of leaked coolant. We've got the same around the expansion tank and there's also a leaky trail down the side of the radiator. So there's definitely a couple of different places that we've, that we've got to sort out here. Now we've got loads of room in front of the engine here because the previous owner or one of the previous owners actually removed the viscous coupling and engine driven fan that previously took all of this space, which is handy because it means that the new big radiator will actually fit in there which it wouldn't if it still had the old fan on. And in front of it, there's tons and tons of room in this whole cavity down here where we can put the standalone oil cooler for the transmission. Um, and I figure I've probably talked rather too much now, so let's just get into removing this. This bolt here just took me 20 minutes to get off the engine. And right now I'm kind of hating life. So this holds the lower radiator hose onto the bottom of the engine through a little P-clip bracket. Because it only went through two or three thin pieces of metal and then straight into a nut, only needed to be like, I don't know, that long thereabouts. Uh, could have been a lot shorter. And instead I had to fumble for 20 minutes unwinding the nut off the back of it, which actually, no, to be fair, that took 10 minutes. Figuring out that there was a nut on the back of it was the first 10 minutes. I could have got to this really easily with the impact gun if I had the radiator out, but you know, we're kind of in a catch 22 there. In front of me here, we've got the original radiator out of my Rover. Now it's got the two main coolant lines in and out of it on the corners as you'd normally expect, but we've also got these four extra connections and this crossbar that's where the trans cooler fits. So normally we've got transmission fluid coming in this corner here, goes down through a heat exchanger in the end tank, through this crossbar into the top of this side and then down and back to the transmission. And this is the part that we're deleting with the new radiator. So we've got this crossbar still attached here. We've used that to get some references to get the right fittings to connect the trans cooler to the, uh, to the new standalone oil cooler that we've got. Now all we've got to do is pop this bracket off the top because this is what actually attaches it to the body. So we've got these two upper plates and this cross piece that go in the slam panel at the front of the engine bay and hold it all together. So just whiz these out real quick. Well, that's the bracket fitted, so it's now ready to bolt into the car. But before we go ahead and do that and get all the hoses and everything on, let's just do a quick side-by-side -side comparison with the original radiator, which Aidan and Sam are gonna bring into shot now. So here's the new one. And here's the old one. I think you can, uh, you can probably see a bit of a difference there. Now, if you remember, all 
all the way back in episode two, we had a big box of goodies that came with the kit car chassis that we're mostly not using, but we kept a bunch of stuff thinking that one day we'd find a place to put it. And finally, we have found the first thing out of that box that we can use. It's the old oil cooler that was supposed to go on the track car that now isn't. I'm borrowing it instead. So we've had a couple of nice new oil lines made up to fit onto it. We've got some adapters that screw into the ends here that fit directly onto um, some new fittings that are going on the end of my Rover's transmission line. So I've got the transmission hard lines in here. We're just going to cut the flares off the ends, pop their old uh, unions off, and we've got some compression fittings that fit into here. It's all converted, all tested, all nice and good. Didn't realize that was there. So we're going to thread these all on now. We're going to feed the oil lines through the front of the car. There's some nice holes in the front bulkhead here that we can, uh, we can get our oil lines through and we'll start connecting it all up. We're pretty much done here for the day. Sam's not far off jumping in the car and driving it all the way back down to South Wales, which is a pretty promising sign. We've been round the block, made sure everything works and touch wood, it seems to. We've got the transmission lines all reconnected. Unfortunately, I couldn't film quite as much of that as I wanted to. I had to leave Sam alone doing that while I went in and handled my day job because unfortunately I do have a nine to five and right now we're in the middle of the week and it's about 10 in the morning. So I've had to be, uh, I've had to actually be on call. Um, but we've managed to get everything done. I've got a couple of little clips here and there of it all going together, which hopefully Adrian's gonna have spliced into the edit and, uh, and you'll have a fairly good view of where we are. The oil cooler is zip tied in the front, which seems really, really janky, but honestly, compared to running like an entire supporting bracket across the whole width of the car or whatever else we could have possibly retrofit in, it's actually pretty solid. And to be honest, there's no room to sort of jiggle it around or move it or anything. It's actually in there really, really good. Um, we've got the transmission lines, which normally there's a little bit of a worry that I had when I was putting this together because the line from the transmission that comes into this corner of the radiator is kind of loose because originally it was clipped onto the crossbar that was hard fit to the rad. So basically this transmission line was held in place by the other transmission line, which was held in place by the radiator, but we don't have that anymore. So we've had to take a bit of a, um, a, bit of a next, next best and we've tie wrapped it to the, uh, to the metal coolant line that runs under the front of the engine all the way down there, which is pretty solid. It does allow it to move, but it doesn't allow it to move very far and it's metal on metal, so hopefully nothing should get like rubbed through or eaten through because it's just a, it's a steel line we're rubbing, you know, rubbing with no real pressure. So I'm not too worried about that, but it would be nice to get something a bit better in the long term once we've got room to, you know, sort of get the under tray off and maybe put like a proper bracket or something in there. The fan controller here that used to be attached onto here had a little temperature sensor probe we've actually removed completely for a couple of reasons. Um, the probe was sitting on the outside of the hose, so it wasn't really detecting coolant temperature at all. It was detecting ambient temperature, really, which meant if I set it low enough to come on it was low enough in atmospheric here it wasn't low enough of coolant temperature which meant it would just stay on forever so it was really more i may as well have just had an on off switch for the fan which made that kind of useless so we tried putting the probe inside the hose but we couldn't get it to seal back up around here even with just with the engine cranking over it made enough water pressure to leak coolant back out past the um, past the little capillary for the probe so that was a no-go um, what made it worse and what made it kind of not worth bothering fixing was um, Muggins here made a bit of a stupid mistake when I was installing the Kenlo fan a while back and I, um, I went and spade connected one of the terminals on for some reason because it, it, there's a nice convenient relay block here that I could connect that onto. The other connector for the ground, I didn't bother doing anything like that because it wasn't anything nearby, nearby to attach it to. I just went and um, I can't really show you the connector down there, but instead I went and just uh, directly soldered it onto a little blob of earth connections. So we had to cut it off when we were removing the old radiator and it's now not very easy to put back on. What we have going for us instead though, which is gonna, get, gonna make that a lot more manageable than it would have been, is because the radiator is massive. It takes ages and ages for the engine to fill it with heat. The engine starting from cold out here in the driveway, so actually having the radiator warm took about 20 minutes earlier. Um, it's such a massive amount of coolant and copper in there now with these massive new end tanks and everything that if Sam does get caught in traffic on his way down, he's probably got a few minutes before anything horrible happens and he can always just turn the engine off because I've also fixed the starter motor now, which is nice. Um, 
And as soon as he starts moving, we just had this round the block earlier, the radiator, after we had it idling at the front of the house, was uncomfortably hot to touch, like he didn't actually want to have a hand in contact with it. We went round the block here, like not even 20 mile an hour. So there was ba barely any airflow across the radiator and um, came back and it was nice and lukewarm. So it's obviously doing its job really, really well, even at low speed, I think at highway speed, the amount of airflow across it will have no worries at all. The fin density on it is huge. So tremendously overcooled as long as the car's moving. So I've got no real worries. The fan is still on the front. And I think while Sam's down in Pembrokeshire with the car, he's gonna get that rewired on a bit more properly. Um, so yeah, I think uh, nothing really to worry about. Now there's one remaining problem with the radiator and unfortunately it's one that there's no way in hell we can fix on the driveway here and that's that it's actually too tall for the engine bay. So the bonnet here at the front has got a reinforcement br um, bracket across the hinges and everything at the front of the engine bay and a little seal that normally sits onto the top of the radiator. And all together with the new radiator being a bit too tall and then that seal and then that bracket and everything, it's actually holding the bonnet pretty much a full centimetre proud of the wings of the car, which on the one hand gives it kind of a cool sort of bad boy raised bonnet look. On the other hand, it's really naff and I don't like it. Um, but we don't really have much other option at the minute. Sam has to get home and has to have this car going. So we're just gonna have to deal with it. And then if that means massaging the bonnet and everything when he's down there, or maybe uh, dropping the radiator mounts underneath or something, we don't know, but that's what's gonna have to happen. Well, that's it for this episode of Pedalbox. Hopefully you've enjoyed our very quick uh, whistle stop tour of installing a new radiator into the Rover. With any luck, I can now send Sam on his way and he can phone me back from Pembrokeshire and tell me how it's all gone. Fingers crossed. Check out the website and our merch at pedalbox.show slash shop. And if you'd like to support our regular builds, then head over to patreon.com slash pedalboxshow. Show.